Hello, coming to you from St. Martin de Porres. We're enjoying a very beautiful day here in the aftermath of the, uh, the storm from yesterday. I hope um, everyone is doing well and everyone is safe. And may God's blessings be upon you this day. Now, if you recall, I promised that there would be four videos in this series. And this being the fourth will obviously be the concluding one. So we will cover the um, the communion rite and the concluding rites of the Mass and unpack their deeper meaning. And I figured that since we left off with the Eucharistic prayer, I say one or two more uh, brief points about it so that we have a deeper insight, a deeper um, meaning and find the nourishing value of it. Concerning the Eucharistic prayer, I want us to think of what the word Eucharist means. The word Eucharist comes from the Greek word Eucharistia, which means to give thanks. So anything that's Eucharistic is anything that's an act of thanksgiving. Now, you might recall that our readings this past Sunday, the reading, the gospel reading in particular, Describe Jesus as taking the bread, giving thanks, and giving it to the apostles who in turn gave it to the multitude, thereby feeding the 5,000 men, not counting the women and the children. But you notice that motion, right? He took the bread, and mind you, it was evening. So that's a little foreshadowing of the Last Supper, which would take place in the evening. But notice, during evening, he feeds the multitude by doing what? He takes the bread, gives thanks, breaks it, and then gives it to the apostles, who then gives, who in turn give it to the crowds. Well, that act was characterized by him blessing God for his bounty, and then the Father in his abundance provided for all the needs of the crowd. Open-handed, he gives to the poor, his justice endures forever. Well, similarly, but in a even more powerful way at the Last Supper, Jesus, as the Jews would have done for centuries, takes each of the objects on the Passover table, and there was much more than bread and wine, but he takes each of them and says the ceremonial benediction, the ceremonial thanksgiving over each one. But he designates the unleavened bread before the meal and the cup after the meal as his body and blood respectively. But he only does so after he gives thanks. So notice that. He gives thanks. He breaks the bread. Gives it to the disciples and declares that the bread that he gave thanks for is his body. And then likewise the cup after supper. He takes that cup. And he says that the cup that he gave thanks over is the cup of his blood. And then he tells them do this in memory of me. For the early apostles and the ancient Christians, they didn't have what we would call our current format of the Eucharistic prayer with all its moving parts. The ancient Christians, we have some of their Eucharistic prayers and they're a bare bones prayer from our vantage point today. They're essentially like what the preface is, is an act, a pure act of thanksgiving to God for all that he has given us in Christ. So they were convinced in light of Jesus' promise, do this and command, do this in memory of me, that whenever they offer the bread and wine and thanksgiving to the Father for everything done in Christ, that the bread over which they gave thanks and the wine over which they gave thanks was his body and blood. The earliest Eucharistic prayers happened to not even have the calling down of the Spirit or the words of Jesus recounted from the Last Supper. That might come as a shock. But the reason why those weren't included in the earliest moments, by my speculation, is that they experienced the overshadowing power of the Spirit on Pentecost. And they heard Jesus say, this is my body, this is my blood at the Last Supper. So they didn't find a need to recount them. They didn't find a need to formally call down the Spirit or formally recount Jesus' words because those were still very 
uh, imprinted upon their hearts and on their memories uh, and their very lives. So they never, the early apostles and disciples never thought to formally invoke the Spirit upon the gifts or recount the words of Jesus from the Last Supper. They simply, according to the earliest texts we have after the New Testament, for instance, the Didache records some of the earliest Eucharistic prayers that they have, they don't have the calling down the Spirit or the words of Jesus. They simply are an act of thanksgiving for everything that the Father has done for us in Christ. So as Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, and what did he do? He took the bread and gave thanks, took the cup and gave thanks. So also his earliest disciples, when they did this Eucharistia, this thanksgiving, their earliest Eucharistic prayer took the form of a pure act of thanks for what God has done in Christ. That's powerful. And that's essentially what's contained in the preface of our modern Eucharistic prayer. And then we consciously evoke the coming of the Spirit. We consciously recount the words of Jesus and say to the Father, we are offering this in remembrance of his death and resurrection. We consciously call down the Spirit upon God's people, the Holy Assembly, and we offer intercessions for the world. So that's the current format, and that's a holy format. It's very praiseworthy. But I just wanted to note, historically, it's developed over time. And I also want to note why we consciously evoke these things. We weren't present for those events, for Pentecost, for the Last Supper. So there is a deep meaning in us recounting these things, not because God couldn't accomplish it just by us offering a pure act of thanksgiving, just like the early disciples, no, but that for our human need, for God to manifest himself in the church, we visibly invoke the Spirit. We visibly recount Jesus' words. And we visibly offer the bread and wine um, in memory of his death and resurrection. So these things we have to keep in mind are always for us. Remember, Jesus became man for our sake. He didn't become man for his sake. So also, there isn't, from the divine vantage point, there isn't one set way to have Eucharist. However, for the sake of church order, for the sake of preserving the teaching of the church, we had to come with, we had to um, canonize, if you will, prescribed texts for the clergy to use and for the faithful to use. And our Eucharistic prayers took certain forms. The current form that we have, like I said, the calling down the Spirit, the recounting of the words of Jesus, um, the remembrance, you know. It took this, this form for our sake. Not because God could not work just as he did in the beginning, where the earliest disciples just offered the bread and wine in thanksgiving in remembrance of Christ, you know. But it's for our sake that it took the current form that it has. So I hope that that's enlightening, um, that you know at least that there is a there has been a progression in the way that this prayer has developed. And... Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that because there's much more that could be said, but I've, uh, I've already taken a lot of time to explain this point. So in a nutshell, just remember, the Eucharistic prayer as we know it has developed from just a pure act of thanksgiving to incorporating other signs, other ways in which we convey God's presence, the calling down the Spirit upon the gifts, the words of Jesus, the remembrance, and the calling of the Spirit upon the assembly and the intercessions. Those are ways, once again in which we consciously uh, make present or where we make visible things that God is already doing in the Eucharistic prayer. So I hope that helps. If I need to explain that more, I'll do so at another point. But in the meantime, I want to continue on. And so if we're focusing on how the word Eucharist means thanksgiving, I think we all know that 
since Jesus said, take, eat, take, drink, the Eucharist is incomplete without our participation in it. You know how under the old covenant, the high priest and the priest in the temple would offer the sacrifices and then they would partake of them. Sometimes they would invite the Israelite that had brought the offering to partake as well. But principally it was the, the priests of the temple, the sons of Aaron and the sons of Levi, that would partake of the offerings because they sacrificed them. Well, remember what I said last time, that we are one priestly assembly in baptism and in confirmation, you truly share in the priesthood of Christ in a manner distinct from the ordained, but you nonetheless share in Christ's own priesthood. And it's not some metaphorical priesthood. It is not some merely interior priesthood. It is something that you make visible. You make it visible through your Praying of the Eucharistic prayer, remember how I said that there are certain portions of the Eucharistic prayer that you visibly pray aloud, you verbally pray aloud. You can only do that because of your priestly identity and baptism sealed in confirmation. Also, think of how you bring your prayers as a spiritual fragrance before God, but also when we offer the bread and wine, where does the bread and wine come from? It comes from the faithful. So you place the sacrifice on the altar as God's priestly people. So I want to bring this full circle. The Eucharistic prayer, as I noted last time, is the moment in which we offer the sacrifice. Recall that the offertory is the presentation upon the Lord's table before the throne of God, the gifts that we will offer in sacrifice. It is the Eucharistic prayer, the moment of thanksgiving, and in fulfillment of the Lord's command, do this in memory of me, it's in that moment that the bread and wine are Eucharistitized, they're thanksgiving fight. they become the thankful presence of Christ, Christ who is our sacrifice of thanksgiving. The bread and wine become the very presence of Christ in its fullness, his humanity, his divinity, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And so the bread and wine are Eucharistitized, as one of the early saints, St. Saint Justin the Martyr, put it. They are thanksgiving fi. They are set apart by this and placed into a different realm of existence where Christ is seated at God's right hand. Well, if we offer the sacrifice in that, that, that moment, right, and we do so as a priestly people, then in fulfillment of the law, you know, the law of Moses, which is surpassed more gloriously under the new covenant, the priests, you, the priestly faithful, must partake of the offering, even as the priests of the old covenant did. Do you see that flow? In other words, if the Eucharistic prayer is the moment of the sacrifice where we're offering the bread and wine as a sacrifice to God and God receives it, and then in return gives us the sacrificial presence of his son, then the priestly people must partake of the sacrifice that they have offered to God. And so, right after the Eucharistic prayer, we immediately transition into what is known as the communion rite. And the communion rite is meant to prepare us for the reception of communion. So you'll notice the communion rite begins with the Our Father, right? And then the priest will pray, Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. And we'll close that prayer with the doxology for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. I want you to see that as a set, right? So immediately after we offer the Eucharistic prayer, right, we transition into the very words of Jesus, the Lord's prayer, right? And it's one set, you know, so we pray the Lord's prayer and the priest expounds upon that last petition. You notice that that last petition of the Lord's prayer, but deliver us from evil is expounded upon in the prayer that follows by the priest. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil graciously, grant peace in our days, etc., etc. 
And it closes, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Lord, of our Savior, Jesus Christ. In other words, in this moment of Eucharist, right, we come to the Father with the very words of Jesus. And it's not for nothing that we evoke, give us this day our daily bread. The bread upon the altar is our super abundant bread, our daily bread. So we, we invoke the Father of all things who has allowed us to receive, even on earth, those things that are found in heaven and to partake of our heavenly bread and to have the forgiveness of sins. So like when you hear, give us this day our daily bread, give us this day our daily trespasses and the Lord's Prayer, when we're praying that at the Eucharist, I want you to think of the Eucharistic bread and the Eucharistic wine when we pray that. Give us this day our daily bread, the heavenly bread, and forgive us our trespasses, the wine, the, the consecrated wine. Why? Because he said, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Forgive us our trespasses. So when you look at those two petitions, I would recommend that you direct them particularly towards the first one. Give us this day our daily bread towards the Eucharistic bread and then give us this day our daily trespasses. I recommend that you direct that towards the Eucharistic wine, because it's poured out, the blood of the covenant is poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. You'll notice that I personally will do that as I'm offering the Our Father during the liturgy. But notice, you have the Our Father, and then the prayer that follows is an exposition on that final petition, you know, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days. So there's a, there's a flow to that. And it culminates in the doxology. You know, the Lord Jesus is coming and he's bringing his father's kingdom. And so we say amen for the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. And then the sign of peace. If you notice, the sign of peace is preceded by two short prayers. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. In other words, we never invoke the Lord's peace upon us without first asking him to give it to us. Every gift we have comes from above. So it's only after we've asked Jesus to give us his peace that then the priest says, the, pe the peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us offer each other a sign of peace. Notice that flow as well. We, the priest will only invoke the peace of the Lord upon us after we first petitioned him to give us that peace. So we ask him for his good gift. That gift is then invoked upon us. And then we, then we extend that visibly through the sign of peace. And notice that is a priestly act as well. When you give the sign of peace, you are greeting one of your brothers and sisters in the Lord so that you may offer the sacrifice, so that you may partake of the sacrifice worthily. Charity washes away sins, and the kiss of peace, as the apostles will call it, or the sign of peace, as we call it today, is an act of charity, it's an act of love, and love washes away sins. And so that we may be worthy to receive the sacred mysteries, we offer a sign of charity, so that our consciences may be cleansed, so that we may worthily partake of the sacrifice. So, it is a moment of priestly preparation for each of the faithful to ask God for peace, to receive the invocation of peace from the priest, and to then extend that visibly. Remember, you cannot give what you do not have. So if we have not received the peace from heaven, we cannot visibly extend that to one another. Now, Concerning the Lamb of God, you might notice that when the priest fractions the bread, he breaks it, right? And then he takes a little piece and puts it in the chalice. You might notice that in the Eucharistic prayer, when we say the words of Jesus over the bread and then over the cup, when the bread becomes his body, the cup of wine becomes his blood of the new covenant, you'll notice that they're consecrated separately. In other words, the body is separated from the blood, Symbolically, that evokes death, right? We proclaim your death, O Lord. The separate consecration of bread and wine signifies the separation of blood 
from the body, in other words, death. Well, as we're about to partake of communion, symbolically, the priest, when he breaks the host, right, he'll take a piece and mingle it with the, with the chalice, with the consecrated wine in the chalice. Why? I'll read the prayer that he says silently. May this mingling of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bring eternal life to us who receive it. We only find eternal life in the resurrection of Christ from the dead when that light from the tomb shines forth. So in other words, in the Eucharistic prayer, the death of the Lord is visibly signified in a particular way by the separate consecration of the bread and the cup. But right before we, right before we receive communion, they are symbolically reunified the body is placed into the cup, into the blood, to signify by reunion, resurrection, the newness of life. So when you see the priest break the host and put a portion of it into the chalice, he's signifying the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Christ is risen, alleluia. And Jesus, when he stood among the apostles, what did he say when he rose from the dead and he stood in the midst of the apostles? He said, peace be with you. So when the priest says, the peace of the Lord be with you always, he's saying it in the person of the risen Christ. Peace be with you. And then that's, that's doubled down upon, that's emphasized anew. When we take the body of the risen one and mingle it with the blood of the risen one to signify, yes, he is truly raised. His body and blood are united, you know. And then we invoke Lamb of God. And you know the, the Lamb of God and the Behold the Lamb of God prayers. So that I don't have to go over those extensively, but I want to point out to you that this is, again, an invitation for us to prepare ourselves. So not only do we prepare ourselves by offering a sign of peace and charity, but we can consciously ask God for mercy before we partake of the Eucharist. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. So immediately before communion, now we have three moments in which we can prepare ourselves. The very Our Father itself, forgive us our trespasses, right? The sign of peace, charity washes away our sins, right? And then the third, Lord, I am not worthy. So you have three ways in which you can prepare yourself before receiving communion. And remember, everything is about mercy. God says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. So if we just offer that humble heart, if we just come and allow him to feed us and to make up what is lacking in us, then we are truly experiencing his mercy. Mercy is when he makes up in us what is lacking. So I hope that's a consolation. There are three moments where you can consciously prepare yourself as a priest, as a priestly faithful, a priestly member of the faithful, before you partake of the sacrifice. Okay, anything else there? Now, when we come to communion itself, notice how I said in the last video or two that there's always, music always accompanies a procession and every procession closes with a prayer. You'll notice that when we have communion, we all process, right? So we all come to the altar in procession. We come before the king in procession. And it's accompanied by sacred music. Usually it takes the form of a hymn. But you might notice that there's the communion antiphon in your books. That is the ideal, the chant the communion antiphon. But in practice, we usually substitute it with a hymn that we all know. But you get the point that the procession that we make, right? It's not meant to just be done in silence. It's meant to be accompanied by sacred music that stirs up our heart, that stirs up joy in our heart as we go to receive the great king of all. So we have the procession accompanied by sacred music. We all partake of the Eucharist. 
and the priest or the deacon cleanses the vessels, and then after a moment of silence or so, which would be appropriate, the priest concludes everything with the prayer after communion. So do you see that flow? That the prayer after communion, the let us pray, is actually the completion of the procession that you made. It's one action, if you will. One action with but a variety of parts or um, a variety of movements within the one action. So you come to the altar, right? Singing a song of thanksgiving, you know, the hymn. And you partake of the divine bread. You partake of his very body. And then after a moment of silence or so, the priest invites us to pray and concludes the procession with the prayer after communion. So I want you to see that flow. And this is the final act of consecration during the liturgy and the most important. Yes, I said that. It is the most important act of consecration in the liturgy. You might recall in the prior videos, I said that there are three movements of sanctification, three movements of setting apart or consecration during the Eucharistic liturgy. The first is the very sanctification of our, our speech, our sound, our space, our time, through the liturgy of the word. God's word and us praying that sanctifies everything. It consecrates our very speech. Our speech is not common speech at that moment. It is the very word of the Lord. You see that transformation? The first transformation is the taking of our words, our breath, our time, our space, and taking that human word and making it the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The next movement is the taking the very gifts of creation, bread and wine, the fruit of the vine, the fruit of the earth, and the work of human hands, placing them upon the altar, and these being transformed into the word of the Lord, Jesus' own presence. And now we come to the last movement of consecration. Because we are nourished with the scriptures so that you may be built up. So that you may find sustenance. That you may find grace, right? The scriptures, the proclamation of the scriptures is ordered to our fulfillments. That's the point. It's not an end in and of itself. Likewise, the very consecration of the bread and the wine is not for its own, own end. You know, Jesus does bring about a marvelous miracle on the altar in the Eucharistic prayer. When the bread and wine are Eucharistized, when they are taken out of this realm of existence and seated at God's right hand as the very body and blood of Jesus. So it is a powerful miracle, but it's not the greatest miracle. The greatest miracle is when God transforms us into the very body of his son. In other words, Jesus did not give us the body and blood. His, Jesus did not give us the Eucharist as his body and blood just so that we could adore it. We have to be cautious, right? We do adore his presence in the Eucharist, right? But this is meant to be a dynamic thing. It's not just meant to happen after Mass. It's meant to happen within Mass. As Augustine put it, no one can receive the Eucharist without first adoring it. So our adoration of Christ in the Eucharist should happen not just after Mass, which is praiseworthy, right? He's still present. But it should happen first and foremost in the context of Mass. And it should be in the sense that we're encountering his presence. It should not be in the sense that, well, the Eucharist is just an object that I'm adoring on the altar. No, it's a personal presence that's being offered to you through the Eucharist. You know? So the greatest act of adoration during the liturgy is you becoming one with the Eucharist. Do you see that? The greatest act of adoration you can give in the liturgy is to partake of the sacrifice. 
And the reason for this is because Jesus gave everything of himself to us for our sake, not for his sake. Our thanksgiving, our praise adds nothing to his greatness. So the end of the liturgy is not the moment of consecration during the Eucharistic prayer. It's not the consecration of the bread and wine. The end of the liturgy, the ultimate purpose of the liturgy is the transformation of you in Christ. So that's why I say there are three movements of consecration ultimately culminating in the consecration of God's people. The bread and wine are sanctified, they're consecrated so that you may become what you receive, the very body of Christ. So great is the miracle of the Eucharistic prayer, but greater still is the miracle that God brings about in you during the reception of communion. When you become what you receive, the body of Christ, and not in a mere metaphorical sense, because if you truly take his body, if you truly receive his blood, then how can you not become the likeness of what you partake? You become one body, one spirit in Christ, not in some metaphorical way, really and truly, you become the very presence of Christ in this world. You are another Christ. And so you were baptized. You were washed in baptism and became a child of God. You were sealed with the Spirit and confirmation so that this could be completed by becoming the full image of Christ. You know, in baptism, you become a likeness of Christ because you receive sonship. In confirmation, you, became, you become a further likeness of Christ because you received the gifts, the sevenfold gifts of the Spirit, as Christ did. But then you become the full image of the Son when your very flesh and your soul is fused, as adhered to, adheres to Christ's own humanity and divinity. Do you see that? It's powerful. So the moment of communion, the participation, our participation in his presence through the Eucharist is the culmination of everything. It is the ultimate act, the ultimate dramatic scene of consecration. What is it for God to take speech and make it into the word of the Lord? Or to take bread and wine and make it into the word of the Lord. As John the Baptist himself said to the Pharisees, he said, God could take these stones and raise up from them children of Abraham. It is nothing for God to take something from creation and transform that into his very word. What is truly wondrous is when he takes a heart of stone and transforms that into the word of the Lord. You'll notice that after we receive communion and after the priest has closed the communion procession with the prayer after communion, which is usually evoking, may we who are partaken of this gift be strengthened, receive the blessings of it. After this, customarily there are announcements. So, it's housekeeping measures. You know, we're still, we are a divine assembly, but we're still on earth. So it's practically important to have um, updates, community updates, parish updates. So you'll notice in practice announcements will follow that prayer. But then at the very end, there'll be the blessing and the dismissal. And what you, what I would like you to think of is how when Jesus in Matthew 28, when he's about to ascend to the Father, he raises his hands, he blesses the apostles, and then he goes up, Behold, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Okay, what's the deeper meaning with that? Well, we experience that, we make that visible in the liturgy. Because as you go forth, right, you are the body of Christ now by partaking of communion. You are the extension of Christ's presence. Well, you have to go out and sanctify the world. You have a mission. So that 
You can go out, sanctify the world, and then bring the world that you have sanctified back to the liturgy the next time you come to Mass. You see? Full circle. You are consecrated during the liturgy so that you can go out into the world, sanctify the world by your priestly authority in baptism and confirmation, and then make a return of what you are blessed at the next time you offer the Eucharist. But we need to be strengthened. So as Jesus blessed the apostles upon the mountain before he ascended, so also he blesses us again before we go forth to make disciples of all nations. So the moment of blessing and dismissal is really, it's a making visible of what Jesus did on the mountain, blessing us and affirming our priestly identity so that we can go forth and proclaim the good news to every creature until all things are returned to God in Christ, until all the nations are gathered into the peace of God's kingdom. And at the very end, when, after the blessing, when the deacon says, go forth, the mass is ended, or go in peace, right? I want us to reflect on go forth, the mass is ended. In the original Latin, it goes, ite missa est, ite missa est, ite meaning go, missa est meaning it is sent. So we get the word mass from the term missa. So it's very interesting that whenever we call the, Euchar the Eucharistic liturgy the mass, we're calling it by the very ending of the liturgy, missa. Missa est, it is sent. It's always baffled people what this phrase means because it's ambiguous. What is the it there? Ite missa es, go it is sent, or go it has been sent. What is the it there? Some have speculated that it is the sacrifice, that the Eucharistic sacrifice has been sent to God. Some have speculated that, um, uh, whatchamacallit, that it's a reference to us going forth, that the church is being sent. Well, I recommend to you, or suggest to you, that regardless of which it originally was, for us today, it is clearly both. Ite misses, go, it has been sent, or go, it is sent. It's a description of how our sacrifice of praise has gone up to heaven and that we being empowered by it now go forth. We are now sent by virtue of the blessing. So I, I hold that out for your meditation. I hope you've found uh, some very nourishing things here. And may you just have a very blessed day. If you have any questions, please uh, send send them to me. I'll leave a link below. I just encourage you to make as many comments or give as many thoughts as possible. But I hope this has given much more meaning. Much more meaning. And I hope this understanding of the Eucharist shows you that we're not just doing rituals for ritual sake. We're doing this because... We want to more fully become who we are. We want to more fully find fulfillment and peace in God's presence. And all these things give us meaning. They nourish us. They give us life. So I hope, my hope and my prayer is that you found something very nourishing here. And that you can take that and have it animate your prayer life. So have a blessed day and stay well. Thank you.